Did you know that one of the largest banks in Switzerland was just killed by... Twitter? Yup, you heard that right. In the world of high finance, one bank's downfall can send shockwaves through the entire industry. And that's exactly what happened when Credit Suisse, one of the largest banks in Switzerland, fell victim to a bank run that was largely driven by social media. Wealthy depositors began pulling their funds out at an alarming rate, causing the banks to lose a staggering $10 billion a day. And guess what? As the crisis unfolded, the CEO of Credit Suisse blamed Twitter. Who is responsible for this disaster? Well, look, last autumn, we had this social media storm. But the damage had already been done. The bank was forced to sell itself to UBS, with the Swiss government changing laws to expedite the process, while Janet Yellen breathed down their necks. But the fallout didn't end there. The Swiss government incinerated a class of bonds known as COCOs, which were supposed to be loss-bearing but ended up keeping everyone else whole and even paying out shareholders. This move had a devastating ripple effect on weaker banks around the world, making it nearly impossible for them to raise money for COCOs. Do you know what this means? It means that if you don't do what the Fed and Treasury Secretary tell you to do, they won't back our deposits, and if you get a bank run, that's your problem. The Swiss GDP is 800 billion, and they just rescued a 550 billion bank with Fed backing. In this video, we'll see how the Fed has effectively taken over the banking systems of the US connected financial world, and how the power dynamics of the global financial system have shifted. This is the story of how one bank's downfall changed the game for the entire industry, and how the American financial empire flexed its muscles to maintain its dominance. It was Thursday, March 16th of 2023, when the emergency call came in from the Swiss establishment. Colm Callagher, the chair of UBS, had plans to celebrate St. Patrick's Day and watch Ireland play England at rugby, but chaos was brewing at crosstown rival Credit Suisse, which had become the basket case of European banking. A day earlier, a 50 billion Swiss francs liquidity backstop from the Swiss central bank had failed to stop the crisis of Credit Suisse. Shares had plunged after the chair of its largest investor, Saudi National Bank, bluntly refused to put in any more money. Global markets were already anxious. US regulators had just seized control of Silicon Valley Bank after the withdrawal of $42 billion of deposits in a single day. The same was happening at Credit Suisse. It was losing more than 10 billion Swiss francs of wealthy clients' money daily. And that was on top of the 111 billion Swiss francs that vanished after a social media rumor in October that it was on the verge of bankruptcy. So on Wednesday, the so-called trinity of the Swiss National Bank, Regulator Finma and Minister of Finance summoned Credit Suisse Chair Axel Lehrmann and Chief Executive Ulrich Korner for a call. In this meeting, they delivered a bombshell. You will merge with UBS and announce Sunday evening before Asia opens. This is not optional. Just like that, Credit Suisse's fate was sealed. But how exactly did we get here? To understand that, we have to go back in time and get some background about this 167-year-old bank. Born in 1856, Zurich's Credit Suisse fueled Swiss Railroad's growth. It reigned as Switzerland's second largest bank, just behind UBS. Their speciality? Managing wealth and crafting investments for the rich. However, Credit Suisse faced its share of challenges, including scandals and financial losses. The bank faced market crises, executive shakeups, and financial losses. They were hit hard by Greensill Capital and Archigo's capital management's collapses. In 2021, Archigo's fall cost Credit Suisse $5 billion, wiping out a year's profit. Customers were not happy. In October, a social media uproar sparked rich clients' withdrawals. Executives reached out to 10,000 plus wealthy customers, reassuring them of the bank's stability. Deposits plunged 40% to $252 billion, and total assets dropped 30% to $571 billion. In 2022, they reported a net loss of 7.3 billion francs, following a 1.7 billion loss the previous year. Investors grew uneasy. Wealthy clients, typically conservative, became worried. It's been a slow motion unfolding. That reached a tipping point a few days ago, said Octavio Morenzi, Opima's CEO. 
You might think all of this sounds similar to Silicon Valley Bank. It sort of is, but there's an important difference. Credit Suisse catered to the wealthy, from billionaires to sovereign wealth funds. As Switzerland's number two bank, it served savers and companies in ultra-conservative Switzerland. Its vast offerings included investment banking and asset management. Global regulators deemed it systemically important due to its size and financial ties. Silicon Valley Bank focused on US venture capitalists and tech startups. While Credit Suisse hedged against rising interest rates, Silicon Valley Bank had almost no hedges on its huge bond portfolio by 2022's end. So what caused the crisis at Credit Suisse? Investors were on edge after Silicon Valley Bank's sudden collapse in California. Panic rippled through the market, causing a global sell-off of bank shares, including Credit Suisse's. Things took a sharp turn on Wednesday, as we discussed earlier. Amar al Ghudairi, the chair of its largest investor, Saudi National Bank, dropped a bombshell. When asked if it would put in any more money, he bluntly replied, absolutely not. Let's pause for a second. Saudi National Bank, aka Credit Suisse's largest investor, basically says no way in hell we're investing any more money. Which would make you wonder, if not even their largest investor had confidence in them, why would UBS agree to buy it? The answer is easy. They were pushed by regulators. That's right. Regulators shoved UBS into a deal to calm banking panic, worrying about insolvency. This is what a person close to Credit Suisse said. By Thursday, we were all together in Zurich, and it was clear that the government was going to push one way or the other for a solution by Monday morning, at all costs, to protect Swiss national interest and banking interest more generally on a global basis. Imagine this. Keller Sutter, the finance minister, in the heat of intense negotiations coordinating with US and European officials. The pressure is mounting and global regulators demand rapid action. The US and French are pushing the Swiss hard. Janet Yellen, the US money boss, talks with Keller Sutter many times over the weekend. The negotiations start friendly, but soon the gloves come off. Credit Suisse fiercely resists the proposed deal. UBS, on the other hand, only agrees to rescue its rival at a low price, protecting itself from regulatory probes. UBS wants to lowball Credit Suisse, but Credit Suisse aims for a premium. By Friday evening, things get dire. Credit Suisse loses 35 billion Swiss francs in deposits, and banks like BNP Paribas and HSBC cut ties. Regulators think Credit Suisse might not open on Monday. Enter a new contender. Larry Fink's BlackRock. The US firm's CEO gathers his team, reiterating his mantra. To be in the game, you've got to play it. During the financial crisis, BlackRock made a game-changing move. They bought Barclays investment arm BGI for $15.2 billion in 2009, catapulting them to the top as the world's biggest asset manager, with $2.7 trillion in assets. Fast forward, and they now dominate the global investment scene, managing a staggering $8.6 trillion. And they saw a similar golden opportunity in Credit Suisse's troubles. But the Swiss government had other ideas. The most credible alternative was BlackRock, but it wasn't what the Swiss government wanted, reveals someone in the know. Negotiations ran through Saturday, global regulators eager to agree on a deal structure by nightfall. But deadlines kept slipping as officials scrambled to sort out the right documentation. There was another hiccup. UBS's email system lagged, delaying messages. Stressed supervisors urged phone calls instead. Frustrated by UBS's poor communication, Lehrman opted for a letter. General counsel Marcus Detelm drafted it, and it landed on Saturday evening, laying out reasons why the proposed transaction was a no-go. In reply, Callagher phoned his Credit Suisse counterpart from outside a restaurant, offering $1 billion in stock for the whole group, about 0.25 Swiss francs per share, way below Friday's 1.86 Swiss francs closing price. Now get this. The government stepped in, planning emergency legislation to strip both sets of shareholders of their voting rights on the deal. Credit Suisse was livid and refused to sign. Middle Eastern shareholders were furious too. You make fun of dictatorships and then you can change the law over the weekend? What's the difference between Saudi Arabia and Switzerland now? It's really bad, said someone close to a major shareholder. 
As the day's end approached, the Trinity intensified pressure on both banks, threatening to remove Credit Suisse's board if they didn't agree. As the talks went on, UBS was pushed to raise its price, finally agreeing to $3.25 billion in stock. In return, UBS got more help from the government, including a 100 billion Swiss francs lifeline from the SNB and a loss guarantee up to 9 billion Swiss francs after taking care of the first 5 billion. People close to the deal said that the final terms were so good for UBS that they just couldn't say no, but a Credit Suisse advisor said the terms were really bad and unfair, and showed no respect for the rules and the rights of shareholders. Funnily enough, the two sides hardly met face to face, even though their offices were right across from each other in Zurich's Paradeplatz Square. Details were so hastily finalised that UBS CEO Ralph Hamers couldn't answer analysts' questions about Credit Suisse's debt during a presentation later that night. We will have to come back to you, he said. Credit Suisse's board reviewed the final proposal and, after consulting advisors, accepted UBS's $3.25 billion offer. Finance Minister Keller Sutter breathed a sigh of relief, releasing days of tension over the Swiss and global financial system's fate. A hurried press conference in Bern unveiled the historic deal. The failure of a systemically relevant bank would have had severe repercussions, Keller Sutter said. Switzerland needs to be aware of its own responsibility beyond its own borders. When asked who was responsible for the disaster, Credit Suisse's Lehrman blamed Twitter. Hindsight is wonderful. Last autumn we had a social media storm and this had huge repercussions, he said. Callaher was more direct. This acquisition is attractive for UBS shareholders, but let us be clear, as far as Credit Suisse is concerned, this is an emergency rescue. One thing is sure, it's crazy that the government changed the Swiss laws to get this deal done quickly, while US politicians breathe down their necks. Many people believe the Fed is now in control of the banking systems of the US connected financial world. They make the rules now, and who knows where that's going to take us. What implications will Credit Suisse's troubles have on the global banking system? Drop a comment down below and let me know. If you're hungry for more juicy secrets and scandals, check out my video about the truth behind the SVB collapse. And of course, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. We'll see you in the next video.